You all welcome to our Bible study and prayer meeting and let us come near to our great God in prayers as we begin. Our dear Heavenly Father, we bless your holy name. We thank you because it is our joy and privilege to come again into your house, to worship you, to glorify you, to fellowship with the triune God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit and to have fellowship with each other around your word. Father, there is no greater honor and privilege for us on this side of eternity. This is a foretaste of heaven. Cause us to drink deeply from your presence here tonight and to feast at your table. You have brought us here to bless us. Help every one of us. You know our hearts, Lord. Meet us at the point of our needs. We pray that you have mercy upon us. We sin and we go astray. And you know when we do those things. So forgive us, cleanse us, let us know the joy of forgiveness here tonight. And let us be inspired as we go through this inspirational book, which is your word. Help us to receive from your word tonight. We pray that you draw near to our brothers and sisters who are not able to join us here this evening. Let them know your encouragement. Let them know your comfort on every side. Be with your people. Let your presence attend to them. And so, Lord, we thank you because you are here. You promised where two or three of us are gathered in your name. There you are in our midst. So help us as we look at your word and as we come later to pray. We ask that your great name will be glorified. For we ask all these in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Uh, what we find in the book of Revelation is a letter written to encourage uh, the church, it lets us know that whatever is happening to us in this world as the people of God, that our God, the sovereign king of the universe, is still in control. And he has the final say. All things are moving to his end and he will give us the victory. In what we covered two weeks ago from chapter 7, we saw that God's chosen and elect, uh, which involves two groups of peoples there in our text, the Jews and the Gentiles, uh, they are saved from his wrath. And they are saved through the redemptive work of the Lamb. It is not without this. It is not apart from this. And this has been God's plan even before the world began. Some people, they think uh, about this whole idea of God's election and choosing, and they are uncomfortable with that. But when you have a problem with God's choosing and election, you are questioning his sovereignty. We did not choose God. It was he who chose us. Read in Deuteronomy what it says there, chapter 7, just... Read uh, quickly from verse uh, 6 to 8. It says, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you because you were more in number than all other people. For you were the least of all peoples. And it says in verse 8, But because the Lord loves you, and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, and the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And those words, they um, are emphasized in John 15, where our Lord Jesus says, John 15, 16, You did not choose me. But I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. Whatever he acts of the Father in my name, he may give you. This is the promise of the Lord Jesus Christ to us again, emphasizing that we, do not, we did not choose God. It is he who chose us. And, and uh, turning to our text in Revelation chapter 8, where we will be covering uh, today we're looking at the whole, uh, the whole chapter. We read from verse 1 
uh, to 8, and we find in there what I have titled, A Warning from Heaven. A Warning from Heaven. And that is the title for our Bible study this evening in Revelation chapter 8. I read from verse 1 to the end. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense, and he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth. And a third of the trees were burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. Then the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. And a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. And the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch. And it fell on the third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died from the water because it was made bitter. (coughs) Then the fourth angel sounded. And a third of the sun was struck. A third of the moon and a third of the stars. So that a third of them were darkened. The thought of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. And I looked, and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, because of the remaining blast of the trumpet of the three angels, which are about to sound. Amen. 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 Father, we pray as we continue that you... Come to us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Give us understanding and bless your word to our hearts. Let it, let it do us good. Let us receive from your almighty word here this evening. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. A warning from heaven. Again, is the title for the Bible study this evening. And it is a message uh, from heaven to the world. It is a message for those who reject God and have not received the salvation he provides through his son. There are those who look at the book of Revelation and they conclude that it is a book of judgment. And rightfully so, if we simply take what scripture presents to us, we see the judgments of God in this last book, of the Bible. But what we also find in here in Revelation is the gospel plea. And this is man's opportunity to find this God, to have peace with him. It's man's opportunity to be saved from the end that is coming. Revelation is a book of noises, thunderings, lightnings. And earthquakes, verse 5. But we find there in our text a moment of silence in heaven, verse 1. Before the end begins. And this end, it has to do with the world. So it says in verse 5, Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings. And an earthquake. Before we arrive here at this chapter, uh, we see that the judgments of God are upon the earth through the activities of the four apocalyptic horsemen, which are shakings. There is uh, 
killings, there are wars, there are plagues, famines. The Lord is trying to wake up a dying world through his smitings before the end comes. We find the believers there who are martyred, verse 9 in chapter 6, they are killed unjustly, which is a sign to the world of the coming wrath of God, which will avenge his people. But the world doesn't take this to heart when the people of God are killed unjustly. They do not consider that it is a sign of God's soon coming judgment. The world doesn't know or considers as as Psalm 116 verse 15 mentions, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And the fact is, uh, the righteous are going through tribulations. They are going to go through it. But a time is coming when things can not be remedied. Things cannot be rectified. Things cannot be reversed because it will be the end of all things. It is what the prophets as well as the apostles called the day of the Lord. It comes upon the world like a snare. The apostle writes, it breaks in like a thief in the night upon them. They are caught on our ways, just as it was on the days, uh, in the days of Noah. You read that people were eating and drinking and giving to marriage. It was business as usual until the moment Noah entered the ark. And then the flood came and destroyed them all. You see the lamentation of the world in verse 17 of chapter 6. When that time comes, they say there, for the great day of his wrath has come. And who is able to stand? Joel says, who can abide on that day? So it, it is really a serious uh, thing. This is what happens to the people of the world, as mentioned in verse 15 there. You see all the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave, every free man. This just includes... Everybody. And you get a sense of the end coming upon the people of the world. Christ saves us from the wrath to come. The people of God have not been appointed unto wrath, but to receive salvation through Jesus Christ. The apostle writes to us, he is our blessed hope. And he comes to save us. Jesus comes to save us from the coming wrath. In all the tribulations before that day are what he called the beginning of sorrows or bed pains in Matthew 24. These are what we find. Deceptions, wars, rumors of wars, famine, plagues, earthquakes, and so forth. But he says there that the end is not yet. And then he said that there will be great tribulation, such as not uh, been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor shall ever be. And then he mentions after the tribulation of those days, uh, the sun will be darkened and so forth. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. You can read about this when you get home in Matthew 24. These are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Christ there goes on. To describe the events that are similar to what we find here in Revelation chapter 6 from verse 12 down to 17. Which happens at the end of the age. He talks about the cosmic uh, disturbances. That the, 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 the sky will be rolled back like a scroll. And we find that here. After these things, chapter 7 verse 1. John sees something else. He says, after these things I saw. He sees something else in his vision. And what he sees, which we covered two weeks ago, is the sealing and redeeming of God's people. And we find the concluding words from uh, uh, verses 15. There in chapter 7, it says, Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he sits on the throne. He who sits on the throne will dwell among them. 
They shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is a portion of the righteous, those who God has saved. And we find similar words uh, to what we read here in the last chapter, chapter 22. It says there from verses 3 to 5, uh, which is really about God dwelling amongst his people. It says, And there shall be no more cross, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their four heads. And when we look at this chapter 7, we see uh, the, 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 the ceiling on the foreheads of uh, the, the, the servants of God, the tribes of Israel. And if we read further, we see this multitude uh, from every tribe, every nation, every people and tongue. These are the Gentiles. You have the Jews and the Gentiles are standing uh, before God. It says they shall see his face in Revelation chapter 22. And his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. So these are the people of God whom the Lord has redeemed before him, worshipping him and the Lamb. So going back to our text here, again, as I've mentioned before, Revelation is a series of visions John had, which were communicated to him by symbols. What John sees happening consecutively, one after the other, doesn't necessarily mean they happen in this manner, in reality. We know clearly from scriptures instances where God saved his people from his wrath. This was clearly depicted, again, in the account of Noah. When he went into the ark and Christ said that his coming will be like the days of Noah. We find the prayers of the saints going back to chapter 6 verse 9 and 10. The, the saints that are under the altar. They are praying, crying for their blood to be avenged on those who dwell on the earth. Notice there that. Uh, this cry is against those who dwell on the earth. In other words, they are calling for the judgment of God upon the earth due to the injustice, the crime and inhumanity that brought about the death of the Christian. It is sin that causes this. It is the sins of the world that are responsible for uh, the death of the Christian, both directly and indirectly. And for those saints there which are crying to God for vengeance, uh, judgment is not denied but delayed. They are given white robes and told to rest for a little longer, verse 11, until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were, were completed. And during this duration, as they are told to wait, the world will go on as normal. Life goes on on the earth as usual. Man will continue with his wickedness. And then the sixth seal is open in verse 12. And we find there cosmic disturbances. Uh, humanity begins to cry out that the great day of the Lord's wrath has come. Verse 17. Again, we know that the people of God are spared God's Wrath, as uh, chapter 7 illustrates, the end has come, and yet, in the context of that, there is a window of opportunity. You find there in chapter 8, there is silence in heaven for about half an hour. There is silence there, John records, for half an hour, half an hour according to John's time on the earth. But we know that in heaven, half 
an hour doesn't register because there is no time in eternity. John tells us from this standpoint of the earth, we know that uh, time has to do with this side of eternity, that there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. But in eternity, that would seem like a very, very long time. In this silence, we find the warning from heaven. It is God's window of opportunity for man to repent and respond to the gospel plea before the end comes and man is undone. He's without remedy. There is silence. You didn't read that, read about the trumpets going off and the rapid wrath of God being poured out. There is silence. There is a moment where as if nothing happens. In heaven, as far as God's program and agenda for his wrath to be poured upon the earth. They are crying for the great day of his wrath has come. But we find this silence here. Remember that it is Christ who is causing these judgments leading up to the end of the age. He is the one opening the seals as we saw from chapter 6. He opens the seventh seal in our text here in chapter Eight, and again, there is silence before we find the activities that uh, connects to what we read there uh, in chapter 6, which has to do with uh, the day of his wrath, which has come. We know from chapter 6, which I have mentioned, that the saints are praying under the altar uh, for vengeance. That, that is when the fifth seal was open. We find prayers. There are prayers here again in uh, verse 3 of chapter 8. It says, Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. So the prayers of the saints, the future here again, What do we understand by what we read here? Previously, they have been told to arrest for a little while until the numbers of them are complete, which should be killed. And here we find their prayers along with the activity in heaven. Does it mean that their numbers are now complete and God is about to move in wrath in answer to their prayers. This is just something that um, I picked up during the study and we can uh, bear in mind as we continue. It says there that another angel having a golden censer and a censer basically was what you uh, uh, found in the tabernacle. It was an item which was like a cup with a long pole and they used to uh, take Incense, the tabernacle was made, the tabernacle in the wilderness, it was made according to the likeness of things in heaven. And in the tabernacle, you have uh, the altar of sacrifice in the outer court. And uh, in our text, this obviously relates to uh, the martyrs which, whose blood had been shed they were under that altar. It says there in verse 9 of chapter 6, they, they, they were under the altar. The, the, the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God. So that has, has to do with sacrifice, the blood of the martyrs that have been shared. But the altar of incense we read about here, because that is the altar here we read about in verse 3 of chapter 8. It is called the altar of incense. This is before the throne of God. This is just by the curtain of the most holy place. Before you go into that place where the ark of the tabernacle is where the Shekinah glory of God dwelt. There was an there was an altar of incense uh, 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 there, and it is before the throne of God. And the 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 high priest would offer incense from that altar uh, before the Lord. And this relates to the prayers and praises of God's people. That's what that altar of incense symbolizes. They offer the incense with their prayers and praises to God. So we witness now in in, uh, 
verse 3 of chapter 8, that the prayers of the saints are now being offered before God, together with incense upon the golden altar, which is before the throne. And it gives us this idea that it's like their prayers are being answered now, in a sense, knowing that judgment will begin to follow. It says there in verse 4, And the smoke of the incense, the incense that is offered with the prayers of the saints, ascended before God from the angel's hand. It ascended before God, and God will receive that uh, uh, sacrifice of the incense and the prayers. And it will mention there as well in verse 5, Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. See? It says the, 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 the incense was offered with the prayers of the saints, verse 3 and verse 4. The smoke will ascend before God, and now uh, the angel will take the censer, fill it with fire from the altar, and throw it to the earth. And what, would, what will happen as a result of that? The noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. That's what it mentions there. And we find earthquake in uh, 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 verse 2 of chapter 6. It says, I looked when he had opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black. There is cosmic disturbance. So we see this things like repeating itself in the book of Revelation. Verse 6 says of chapter 8, So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The seventh seal which the Lord opened, verse 1, is an introduction to the seven trumpets which are illustrative of the wrath of God being poured upon the earth. We find that when the seventh trumpet is sounded, you find in Revelation 11 verse 1, we hear these words, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And we find what is written in verse 19 of chapter 11. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, and an earthquake, and a great hail. Almost similar to what we find here in chapter 8, in verse 5. We see a similar thing here. Are they one and the same thing being depicted at different points and settings in John's visions? Again, these are things for us to bear in mind as we go through this mysterious book. I'm not saying that they are one and the same thing, that this is definitely uh, the case. I do not know that because it says as well in, in Revelation chapter 15 verse 1 that the seven bulls, you read about uh, the seven bulls there it says they are the completion of God's wrath so you find the wrath of God depicted in various ways by the trumpets by the bulls the main thing that we must bear in mind as we go through this book is the main theme of the book which is the lamb wins the victory over sin Satan and the fallen system of this world through his redemption. Find in chapter 22, they are worshipping the Lamb there before his throne. And it says there that there shall be no more curse. And this is a curse that came as a result of sin, humanity's sin. Going back to Genesis chapter 3, when man's sin, he became cursed. All of creation became cursed because of the sin of man. So that is the main thing we have to bear in mind. That the Lamb wins the victory over sin, Satan. And the fallen system of this world. Through his redemption. It is by his redemption. That we see the victory. That he wins. And we see the victories. So what do we make of. The four trumpets. That are sounded here. In our text. Uh, chapter 8. They commence. The wrath. Of God. The world exclaims that. This time has come upon them. They are 
cosmic disturbances, as we said previously. We find that in verse 7, as well as verse 8, verse 10, and verse 12. We see things happening in the sky, falling from the sky upon the earth. It says there in verse 13. And I looked and I heard an angel flying through the mist of heaven saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blast of the trumpet of the three angels which are about to sound. It's almost like things, they get more serious and grim. But before we get there, we find this silence in heaven. Before the trumpets, they commence, which are a warning from heaven. A silence, a warning from heaven for the inhabitants of the earth. You find three woes, which are emphasizing is this Jewish thought of things being stacked one upon the other. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Showing us the seriousness of what is about to happen. The seriousness of the remaining three trumpets that are about to be sounded. The judgments of God are already upon the earth. There is deceptions, unrest, political instability, wars, earthquakes, famines, plagues, and so forth. Just like in our world today. These things are happening. They are shaking. They are the ways of God trying to get the attention of man. To wake man out of his spiritual slumber. And get him to seek his creator while he may be found. And for him to have peace with God before the end comes. And these shakings, they are uh, pointing us. They are indicators pointing us to the day of God's wrath. You speak to people out on the street. And you tell them about hell, they, they say to you that this is hell. They say this is hell. It's almost like, could anything be more worse than what we are going through in this world? You turn on the TV, things are very awful. They are so bad. Some people, they turn on the TV, they watch the news, and they just weep because of what they see. But all that is still nothing. All that is still nothing. These shakings as they were, these plagues, these famines, these earthquakes, natural disasters, people are dying, people are suffering. They are just indicators pointing us to the day of God's wrath which is coming upon the earth for all those who reject God. There will be no remedy then. You can't try to make things right then. It will be too late. The end of the world has come upon you. But before that day come, we find here, There is that window of opportunity before that day comes. It is a warning from heaven. And again, you think about the days of Noah just before the flood. For 120 years, scholars, they tell us that Noah was building the ark that God had instructed him to build. A way of escape for humanity. And during these times, the earth is filled with unimaginable violence. Let's see how the Bible describes it in Genesis chapter 6. Let's see what it says there. Again, I want to remind you that Christ said that the coming of the Son of Man, the days of his coming will be like the days of Noah. See what it says in Genesis chapter 6. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men. The sons of God, if you read the book of Job, they are the fallen angels. The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. This is perversion. Serious perversion. But this is the reality of the state of the earth. This is what was happening as the Bible simply puts it to us. 
And the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever. You see, man had a spirit in him that God had created. Job tells us that there is a spirit in man and the inspiration of the Almighty gives him understanding. So there, is a, there, is, there, was an, there is an organ in man that God could interact with. It was a spirit that God placed in man, which was like the life of man. And God could no longer have interaction with man and communal. Why? Because of the state of perversion, decay, defilement of the spirit of man. So God says, my spirit shall not strive with man forever. I will not continue to wrestle with him, with his conscience. For he is indeed flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. And it says there were giants on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men. Sexual union between these spiritual beings and humanity. That's what the, I know it's hard to take in, but that's what the Bible says. It says, and they bore them children. These things, you cannot even begin to imagine it. You cannot begin to think on it. Since they were born children to them. How is it possible? I don't know. But that's what the Bible says. These were mighty men who were of old. Men of renewal. Giants upon the earth. Men that were not the natural and the normal men that God created. Look at what it says in verse 5. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man. Man. Humanity. Everyone. The whole earth was great in the earth. And that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That, that was, that state of the depravity was set. It was set. It says only evil continually. There was no going forward, no going backward. It has been set. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth. He had made humanity, he created human beings. And he, he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. So for God to say this, it was very serious, and that so much so that the only remedy for God was to just get rid of humanity. And it was very, very serious. Man had come to the end of himself. But look away in verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. What a breath of fresh air. It was not based on what he did or who he was. God simply regarded him. Why? I don't know. Because it was his choice because he is God. He looked at Noah and he was pleased in him. Noah found grace. He found favor before God's eyes. What is unmerited. What is unwarranted. You are undeserving of it. And he tells us a lot about this God. Yes, he's the God who is going to judge. But who is he really? He is the God of mercy and compassion. Who seeks to save. And Peter tells us that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He was preaching, warning the people, telling them to come into the ark. And I tell you, if many had gone into the ark, they would have been saved. But they wouldn't listen. They were given to their ways. And this is the present condition in the world today. The, fall, the world is filled with violence. And the level of wickedness and immorality has gone through the roof. The world has even come into the church. We have compromised. They will tell us, don't be hot and don't be cold. These are extremes. Be in the middle. Keep things balanced. Be lukewarm. That's what the modern day Bible teaches. Who are clever, they will tell us. But the voice of the historic Christ we find in Revelation, which 
the voice which still speaks prophetically says, Be hot or cold. But you cannot be both. You can't have a mixture of both. You can't compromise. You cannot be lukewarm. That is the plague of the church in Laodicea. It is not hot and it is not cold. It is lukewarm. A very important position to be in. Christ says, you cannot be lukewarm unless I will be sick of you. It's a very disgusting position and place. The world should see us and know that because of our stand, because of our message, is it that they repent and believe and be saved or they go to hell? There's no two ways about that. We're not playing with people's life. It's as serious as that. It cost our Lord his own life. And he didn't save us to be passive and to play church and religious games. There's no time for that. Christ says, is either you're hot or you're cold, or I'll be sick of you. Let us come back to the foot of the cross. Let us come back to this dear Savior who loved us and gave his life. Let us take him at his feet. That is what this silence is. That is the message he gives to us. And this silence is a deafening sound. It's a deafening noise. It's the Lord's plea. It's the gospel plea to respond before the end comes. It is only when we give ourselves to the Lord wholeheartedly in wholehearted devotion that he can make us into vessels that he wants us to be. And it's only then we can offer up true sacrifices to him that are acceptable by him. It is not what we produce or accomplish by our own selves, by our own thinking, our ways, our methods. No, it is what the Lord accomplishes in and through us. These are the things that he will receive. We cannot give the Lord anything except that which he gives us, that which he does. He produces in and through us. Even our love, you say we love him. No, we love him because he first loved us. The love that we give to him is what has been shared abroad by him in our hearts by his Holy Spirit. You have those who come to church, they are in church, fine. But the question is, are they in, are they in Christ? They are in church, but they are not in Christ. And they think that they can still be like the world and still be a Christian. They have one leg in the church, the other leg in the world. How is that possible to be a follower, a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ? They come to church. The church is their goal, but not Christ. Christian morality is their goal, but not Christ. They employ the world's methods. What I'm talking about is in the church. It's happening in the church. Christ is speaking to his church in the book of Revelation. They have brought the world into the church. You have Christians. Again they have the appearance of godliness. But the power of that godly life is denied. They profess faith. But they do not have faith. Peter writes in 1 Peter 4.17. For the time has come. For judgment to begin at the house of God. This is the divine text. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? If the righteous one is scarcely saved, is a narrow way. Is a straight path. It's not broad. You cannot bring the world into it. You cannot bring your ways into it. You must deny yourself. Renounce your ways. Pick up your cross and follow him daily. You will find life and life eternally. Let us repent and heed the warning from heaven. Let us take Christ in simple faith. So that in the day of God's 
wrath will not be found without him and be found wanting. The Lord help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's take the red hymn book and turn to 356. Sing softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. 356. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. 356. Let's stand to sing, please. <clears throat> Softly and tenderly Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O sinner, come home. Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you and for me? Why should we linger and heed not his mercies, mercies for you and for me? The cross, come home. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O oh sinner, come home. Time is now fleeting, the moments are passing, passing from you and from me. Shadows are gathering, deathbeds are coming, coming for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O oh sinner, come home. For the wonderful love he has promised, promised for you and for me. Though we have sinned, he has mercy and pardon, pardon for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O oh sinner. Father, we ask again that you bless these words to our heart for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.